Today we're looking at the Physics uh, AS Unit 2 paper from SIA, the 2016 one from June, and uh, it's Waves, Photons and Medical. Question 1. Electromagnetic waves form a spectrum consisting of seven different frequency regions. A typical frequency for the region of lowest frequency is 10 to the 3 hertz, and that for the highest frequency is 10 to the 22 hertz. Complete table 1 by naming these two regions and by stating a typical wavelength for each region. Okay, so the lowest region and the highest region of the electromagnetic spectrum, that's just basic book work. So the lowest region here in frequency would be radio and the highest would be gamma. And they ask for typical wavelengths. Now you can either um, have memorized typical wavelengths for this or you can just uh, operate on the basis of them giving you a frequency and the idea that um, lambda is going to be the speed of light over the frequency so you could do calculations that way so as a rough order of magnitude um, you could do uh, C is like approximately like 10 to the 8 so if you do 10 to the 8 over 10 to the 3 and then 10 to the 8 over 10 to the 22 you should be able to get wavelengths approximate wavelengths uh, so 10 to the 8 over 10 to the 3 gives you 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 8 over 10 to the 22 gives you 10 to the minus 14 so that will save you having to do it from memory but in reality you should have approximate idea of uh, where these will turn up in terms of frequency and wavelength just to be on the safe side. Part B then, uh, figure 1.1 shows graphs of displacement against time for two waves P and Q. There is a phase difference between these two waves and you can see here that they, they peak at two different locations. This one peaks here, this one peaks here and so these dotted lines are showing um, the gap between uh, equivalent points on the two waves. So part B1 is just a simple uh, what is meant by a phase difference. So if you imagine you've got a time axis like this and you've got some waves on it and you've got a couple of waves like this that have a timing difference between them then you know if they peak at specific locations then there will be a time difference between those and we call that the delta of time. Both of these will also have a, a period and so if I come down from the blue one here these crossing points will define a period on the time axis and so the phase difference is um, how far apart the equivalent points are in time which we call delta t over the period of the cycle so it turns out to be the fraction of a whole cycle that they are out of um, sync with each other so that's what you want to explain so it's like the fraction of a wave cycle that one wave leads the other by and then we want to be specific and say that you know we're measuring between equivalent points on each wave. So we're told then something about the diagram it says the dash vertical lines indicate the time that a crest of each wave occurs. Use this information to calculate the phase difference between P and Q. So we need that picture. So I brought the diagram back in and uh, we can see the two points that they uh, mention. They say that there are dashed vertical lines indicating the time uh, between the two crests occurring. So that's our delta t. So this bit here is delta t. 
And we also need a period. And you can see that this cycle starts here and ends here. So the period is 20 milliseconds. And the delta t goes uh, from 5 to 9, so it's going to be the gap between 5 and 9. And so that's going to be 4 milliseconds. And so we can get a phase difference now uh, as a fraction by putting delta t over t. And so that's going to be 4 over 20. Which is obviously a fifth. And to convert it as an angle, we need to multiply that fifth by an angle uh, for a full cycle, which is 360. And that's going to be 72 degrees. So this is one of these questions where you're assessed on your ability to communicate your science as well as your ability to remember it and understand it. So describe an experiment to obtain the refractive index of a material and include in your description a labelled diagram of the apparatus used, a description of the procedure and the measurements taken and how they are used to allow an accurate value of the refractive index to be calculated. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, one is by your basic uh, glass block and doing angles of incidence and angles of refraction for several different um, positions. So you could take a glass block and put a normal on it and then start sending light in at various angles. So you've got an angle of incidence here and that will refract and uh, that will give you an angle of refraction here. You won't be able to see that but you'll get a ray on the way out and you'll need to explain how you can mark the ray on the way out and reconstruct the path in between. This is the path that we're interested in. So by marking the angle on the way in we know it hits the normal so we need to mark there um, going from here, we know it hits here and then we have two points on the output to reconstruct this and then once you've got this line and this line you can reconstruct this line and then you do that for various angles of incidence and so you can calculate an angle of incidence, an angle of refraction and make a table of those you know you've got various angles going in, you're going to also need a sine i and a sine of r so that you can do a Snell's law graph because according to Snell's law the sine of i over the sine of r equals the refractive index that you're trying to find so sine i uh, would equal n sine r and that's sorry and that's like uh, y equals m x if we plot sine i up the side and sine i or, sine r along the bottom then we should get a straight line where the gradient here is equal to the refractive index and that's quite a long way of doing that so there is another way of doing it And if we take a glass block and instead uh, send light towards it at the critical angle. If we do that accurately we will find that the light is coming out at 90 degrees. And we should see, as well as the 90 degree light, we should see total internal reflection with light reflecting out like that. So at that point, this angle in here would be 2C. So your description of this one 
should be that you get a semicircular glass block you shine light in until the refracted light comes out at 90 degrees and then you mark at this position this returning ray here so you, you're marking your ray on the way in you're marking your ray on the way out when this special condition has been met and then you're measuring the angle between those to get 2C why are we doing that? Well, because when you divide that by 2 you get a more accurate value for C and both of these methods should include something about getting an accurate method so we satisfy this condition where the light's coming out like that as accurately as we can arrange it so obviously we need our semicircular glass block, we need a normal in the dead center and we need to be shining our light at that and then we change the angle until the refraction does this and then we mark the ray on the way in and the ray on the way out we measure 2C and we divide by C to get a more accurate value and then we use the equation for Snell's law uh, relating to critical angle because at that point um, one of the angles is 90 degrees and the sine of it becomes 1 so when this condition is met we can get n by taking 1 over the sine of c and we have quite an accurate value for c because we've measured this 2c and divided by 2 to get a more accurate value so you can do it by either method either method is acceptable either you go glass block and take i and r values enough to plot a straight line graph of sine i over sine r um, and you take the gradient or you do this other method part b then uh, monochromatic light is incident on a 60 degree prism uh, which is made of impure crown glass which has a refractive index of 1.73 the situation is shown in figure 2.1 Calculate the angle of incidence phi at face AB if total internal reflection is just to occur at face AC. So getting this angle if the light is coming over and we're getting total internal reflection. So the light is coming across after some kind of refraction there and then it's emerging along the edge which is what happens at total internal reflection. So we've obviously got some measurements to make here. We've got it exiting at 90 degrees here. We've got it in entering at some angle which I'm going to call theta here. And we've got some other angles that we're going to need to work out later like these properties of this triangle x here and y here to help us figure out the angle that we're really interested in which is this refraction angle here so task one is to get this theta from the uh, total internal reflection at the far edge here so if theta is the angle that gives total internal reflection then we'll realize that theta equals the critical angle and if that's the case then we can get theta from the critical angle version of Snell's law because then will equal 1 over sine c which in this case will be 1 over sine theta and theta then will be the inverse sine of 1 over n and so we need to feed that through our calculator sine to the minus 1 of 1 over 1.73 and that gives us a theta of 35.3 degrees and uh, x here will equal 90 minus theta which is 90 minus 35.3 so x equals 54.7 degrees now we can get y because we know two angles of this triangle and so y is going to be 180 minus 60 minus x so it's 180 minus 60 minus 54.7 and that gives us a value for y of uh, 65.3 degrees and now of course we can look at y situation over here y plus r equals 90 so r is going to be what, uh, 90 minus y and that gives us an r at 24.7 degrees now we can actually look at the refraction over here 
because we have an angle of incidence that we're interested in. We have an angle of refraction now that we actually know. So we just substitute into Snell's law and we say that the sine of phi over here over the sine of r equals the n. And that means that phi will be a uh, sine to the minus 1 of n sine r. So that's sine to the minus 1 of 1 1.73 times the sine of 24.7. And that gives us a phi of 46.3 degrees. Now a point to note here is that your calculator mode will affect uh, outcomes when you take sines and cosines. So make sure your calculator is in degree mode if you're working between sines and cosines and angles in degrees uh, because if it's in radian mode none of these answers are going to come out right so just watch that when you're taking sines and cosines and tangents of angles that you need to be in the right angle mode for the angles you're using we're working in degrees here so our calculator should be in degree mode and that concludes questions one and two from that paper. Thanks for watching.